First thing I want to talk a little bit about today is actually homeschooling. So homeschooling is something that I think a lot of people are waking up to given the lockdowns over the past year where their kids have been stuck at home looking at a computer to learn uh, rather than going to a school and sitting at a desk to learn. Uh, so I think a lot of people are more open to the idea of actually homeschooling their kids and actually um, doing that work themselves because they are already kind of doing that work themselves. So if you're doing the work yourself, might as well, you know, go full bore with it and get all the benefits from homeschooling. So there's a bunch of things that are beneficial to homeschooling. So if you have kids or you're thinking of having kids, you might have kids one day, you have a significant other and you've talked about kids, it's good to have a conversation about homeschooling. And um, I'll tell you that most of the conversations I had with homeschooling with my wife revolved more around practical and performance aspects of homeschooling um, rather than some of the more, I don't know, political things that you can actually get into with homeschooling. Of course, when you are handing your kid over to um, a system, then the dogma of that system is going to be part of that kid's education. So if you are concerned that public schools are going to have certain kinds of political dogma that are then transferred to your kids, I could tell you that that is definitely a reality and it's done in a bunch of different subtle ways. One of the most obvious ones is that built into public education is the assumption that public education is a good. So Children are raised to think public education is a good, that them going to school is a good for themselves and for society. And it's something that is only seems to be challenged once you grow up and you start to challenge a lot more of the foundational dogmas maybe of how you were raised. I feel like my generation, Gen Y and um, Gen X to a certain extent are both more into homeschooling and are more questioning of the system because we were raised with a failing institution, with public education that got consistently worse and was producing worse outcomes. And there was constant political talk about how we could fix public schooling. Um, I feel like the millennial generation seems to buy into it more because they didn't see the, the deterioration of the institution. They were only experienced the institution after most of the technical degeneration happened. And so they were fully encased in the dogma. There's plenty of millennials that are out of that, by the way, if you're younger and you're like, wait a minute, you know, I don't believe, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not, I'm just casting generally what I've noticed is that people who are a little bit younger than me, but maybe not the Zoomer age or whatever, they tend to be a lot more committed to the idea of public schooling as a universal good. So once we challenge that, let's actually talk about homeschool as something that, yes, you can do homeschool and it is probably going to be more beneficial for your child than um, public schooling. So as an alternative to public school. Um, so the arguments that I think were very convincing for most of the people in my life were simply performance arguments. Kids who are homeschool, homeschooled do better across the board academically than kids who are not homeschooled. Now, I'm going to give you a slight caveat to that, which is that there is a strong selection bias when you are studying homeschool versus public school because you are selecting for people who have a higher education in general because they're making this decision um, and people who are shall we say, more interested in their children in general. So you are, even if lower income brackets, you're you're really making a comparison of different people. People who are very committed to their child's education and upbringing, even if they are poor, are of course going to have better outcomes, even if their kids are in the public school than the kids whose parents are generally disengaged from the educational experience. Now that's actually a good thing. You want to select for being involved with your children's education and give them a better education in general. Um, but there's also also many other technical reasons why you should consider homeschooling. One of them is that we group kids by age in public school. Now, be before I go any further, I am a credentialed teacher. I have a uh, I have a cleared credential in the state of California, actually, which means I could teach in a bunch of different states. I have taught public school. I've taught at the university level. I've taught private school. I've taught individuals like if lessons, like, you know, guitar lessons and things like that. I've been teaching for at this point almost 20 years. I know what I'm talking about. So at the public school, we group kids by age and we consider the age grouping the most important thing. 
As soon as you know any amount of children more than like one or two, then you know that grouping by age is not academically efficient. Now, you have a group of kids, they're all 10, they're all at different levels in the classroom as far as their skills, their learning potential in different subjects, um, their aptitude in different subjects, their interest in different subjects. So if you have Billy and Jane, Billy really likes math, Jane really likes stories. So Jane is a better reader than Billy, but they're both in the same classroom and Jane has to sit around and wait for Billy to struggle through a sentence when you're doing the round robin reading thing to make sure that kids are reading the story and you are basically doing a a check on all of their skill levels. Jane has to sit through that bored to tears doodling in her textbook, um, not, not learning really anything because she's so far beyond what the other kids in the class who are needing help are at. Then consequently, she can't do math because the teacher is assuming that, you know, because she's maybe below the level of everybody else, she ends up falling further and further behind in math. So at the high school level, which I taught at the middle school and high school level most recently, one of the things that we noticed that there were kids that arrived as freshmen at the high school and they would be so far behind in one subject that it was literally impossible for them to operate in the normal classroom environment in that subject. Maybe just in one subject, but it would be, say, math. And so we'd go back and we'd look at their grades, and they would have failed every math class from a certain point onward. So in fourth grade, they were getting a C in math, so they were passing. Fifth grade, F, and then Fs from then on to high school. Now, why did they make it to high school with us? Because we viewed the grouping of age as more important. It's more important that Billy is with other people that are the exact same age as him or within the same 12 month window as him than it is for him to actually learn math. Um, so at the very core basis, or very core organization of our public educational system, and this applies for private education too, because to get, to get um, accreditation, you basically have to operate the same way a public school does. So this also applies for private school. And it's again, why homeschool is um, really, to me, is superior to both private and public school. So we group kids by age rather than by ability level, and that is very academically inefficient. Either the kid is bored or he's behind. And only if you're one of those kids that's right in the middle of the average on everything and equally interested or disinterested in all your subjects is public school going to throttle you through at the appropriate um, the appropriate speed for things. Uh, so if you're homeschooling, that means that you can have your kid, you could focus on your kid's weak points as much as you need to, and you can let them have accelerated learning with, with their interests and their strengths as much as you want. So the the throttle is completely flexible on any subject that you're doing. I'll use my son as an example because he's in he's in kindergarten right now. <clears throat> his reading level is way, way past where his age mates would be if he were in school. He would be completely bored to tears in a public school trying to read three word sentences when he can read basically at a third grade level already. Now his handwriting, however, he hates doing handwriting because he's bad at it. It's not really like behind his age level, but it's something that you have to really kind of coax him to go through and actually work on it. So his handwriting is not really at the same level as his reading at all. And that creates a little bit of a problem because he can compose sentences that he has difficulty physically writing down. Um, So I came up with all kinds of different ways to work on this. So one of the things I did with reading was I had a, a hundred book challenge last year. And for that 100 book challenge, I had this stuffed Skeleton Bowser toy because he loves Skeleton Bowser. He thinks Skeleton Bowser is just this really cool character um, in a couple of Mario games that we've seen him. So if he read 100 books, he got this prize, this Skeleton Bowser. Well, wouldn't you know it, once I put that Skeleton Bowser up on top of the fridge and had that chart on the fridge for him to check off, well, he was reading like four or five books a day and his reading accelerated so much. Now, he was already ahead, but he got so far ahead on his reading that there's now this massive gulf between this skill level and other skill levels. We have to kind of bring the others up. So imagine in school, you have a kid who's like not that interested in reading. How do you get him to be interested in reading? You have a hundred book challenge for him. Well, what about all the other kids, right? So you get to individually attend to the needs of your kids in a way that you just can't do at a public school. So their, their learning is at the maximum, has the potential at least for the maximum acceleration in every subject according to their aptitude and interest, which is going to help them develop faster and be smarter and be more competent in all of their academic subjects by the time they reach the end of school. Now, the thing uh, that brings me to the next argument, again, why they group kids by age, not by ability. It's because 
Um, academics, that is teaching kids actual things, is uh, is actually not the main goal of public education. It's not a, the main goal in fact, because otherwise you would group kids by their ability level, not their age group. So it's organized, obviously, not to get to any kind of goal of teaching kids the most that they can learn or making them the best kid that they can be or anything like that. Rather, you group them by age because that's where they are socially supposed to be. As soon as you spend any time with kids, you know that group 35, 10-year-olds, some are socially advanced and some are socially not advanced. And they're behind and they're behind in different ways. Some kids tell age inappropriate jokes. Some kids understand things that are way past their uh, normal social level. <clears throat> so the idea that age grouping is for social reasons is also basically bunk. Um, really, the, the whole point is to, I think, condition children to act a certain way as adults. That is, to adhere to the employee mindset, which is show up at work at a very specific time. You have to show up at school at 8 a.m. You have to show up at work at 8 a.m. You have to do the work your boss tells you to do until you are released from your duty. And then we even add things like homework where it's like when you go home, you have to keep being a diligent worker when you go home. This produces a set of uh, conscientious behaviors that are beneficial to industrial society but are not necessarily beneficial to the individual child or the individual as an adult. So the main thing is schools aren't really there to educate you. They're there to condition children into certain ways of acting that are viewed as, quote, good for society. But I don't really think that that's necessarily the case. <clears throat> if I get to more of my political side here, the idea of conditioning someone to be a good employee is basically conditioning them to be a good slave. That is to say, you do whatever the master wants you to do, whatever the taskmaster deems that you should do during the times in which you are required to work before you are released. This is more like classical slavery rather than, say, American um, like the American style slavery system before uh, before the Civil War. Classical slavery, your slave, you were bound to your master, but you could actually earn wages. Slaves got wages, they got money, and they could even buy their freedom uh, back in the classical period. So that's basically what you are asked to do is like buy your freedom, uh, take out a huge loan on a house, you know, go to work eight to five. And if we zoom far enough back, the economy basically views workers as a bunch of little interchangeable cogs, they're skill sets that happen to inhabit this shell called a human being. And so all the humans are interchangeable and movable as will at will. Oh, well, we need skill sets like this over in this city. We'll have everybody move here by offering a little bit more money for that skill set. I don't, I'm, I'm very cynical about that approach to humanity. And I think actually the internet, if it, if the internet persists, could offer a solution in that people could choose to live in a community of their choice and then work remotely wherever their specific intellectual skills are needed. That would be a big boon to society. It'd be a return to actual physical community of people that are like-minded individuals, share culture, share values, share um, a common interest in their locality and are willing to invest in it rather than infinitely mobile, movable worker cogs that have no roots and no sense of permanency in what they're doing. That's basically what's happened to the Gen Y and the millennials who've been completely atomized to where we have no community and no place to live. Well, if you're homeschooling, uh, then you get to avoid that kind of conditioning. Now, there's some other objections to homeschooling that people come up with. Oh, they're going to be like socially retarded or something. And unless they're sitting in a little box, not permitted to talk to their friends for eight hours a day, they get to do recess. Well, when you get down to it and you pull it all away, the only actual social time that kids have at school, unless they're breaking the rules, is recess. So why don't you give your homeschool kid recess for 30 minutes to an hour a day? That's what I do with my kids. I take them to the playground. All the neighborhood kids are there. They're not going to school uh, every single day of the week now either. They go in like two days a week for some reason. I don't know. They, they have no idea what they're doing to try to stop kids from spreading their germs around. Um, it's like only when you get a virus that could potentially kill grandma are you like, oh, kids are like germ factories. What do we do? Why are we having 40 kids in a room sharing snot with each other? This is actually not a great thing. Yeah, it's not. But if you homeschool them, then you don't have to worry about that, about constant like colds and things like that. Um, anyway, so I take them to the, to the playground. They play for like an hour to two hours a day. They get more play at the playground with kids of a variety of ages and different social levels who are friendly and will actually teach them different things. 
Um, the older kids are quite happy to teach younger kids how to play different games, how to play tag, how to play soccer, whatever it is. This is how you throw a ball. This is how you do this. They're actually pretty, pretty happy to teach because then they feel like the superior being, you know, they feel like I'm in charge and I'm teaching somebody how to do something because I know how to do it. Um, so they get, you know, two hours of social play every single day and it's unstructured. They have to actually socialize with kids. That's more than what kids get at public school where they have to show up in the morning. They get a 10 minute recess in the morning maybe a 10, one, 10 minute one in the afternoon, 30 minutes of play for lunch, if that, usually 20 minutes. Then they go home and they have to do four hours of homework. Brings me to my next thing. It's more time efficient. Turns out most of the day in public school is completely wasted. Uh, now I'm gonna get to chat here, but I really wanna focus on what I'm talking about. Um, it's completely wasted because you lose all kinds of time in transitions. Just think about a high school. Um, you have maybe five or 10 minute passing periods that adds up to make a wasted hour every single day in transition. Plus you're losing five minutes at the beginning of a class to take roll. Before you know it, you're at two hours of wasted time during the day, during a high school day, which means there's only f four to five hours of actual work being done tops. Now, because you gain efficiency, like I talked about, because you're not wasting time where you're sitting around twiddling your thumbs, waiting for the teacher to help the kid who's way behind you, you can end up doing even high school level work in just a couple of hours a day. If you could, if you have a, I don't have a homeschool high schooler, but I have family that have done it. And it's like, they would get through their lessons in three hours a day, no homework. Why would you have homework? You don't have homework. That's independent practice. And you have your teacher, your parent there to help you if you need it. And the parents actually end up with more free time too because they're not working. That's a bunch of extra time during the day that they can do other things. Work has sort of business outside their home or something like that. Of course, I have a business with like YouTube and selling books. So I still have a job and I homeschool. Um, and so that's the other thing too. I don't have time to homeschool. Well, it, it takes way less time to homeschool than it does to send your kid to public school. You gain a ton of efficiency. So in the in the extra time that you get, what are you going to do with your kids? Well, you can teach them to farm. Uh, that's what we do with my kids to, uh, a lot of times, though I'm not great at managing time. It's one of my worst things with my kids. I tend to just let them play all day, but they get to play and playing is a kind of learning too. And imagine that you're giving your kid a childhood with three times as much free time and play as the other kids. That's going to be really beneficial to them. And they're going to have a very happy childhood as a result, rather than having to sit in a little desk and not get permit, have to ask permission to go to the bathroom and all that kind of stuff. So um, you get to have a lot of extra time to do extra stuff, learn music, learn art, you know, you, your curriculum could be whatever you want. Next one there. Uh, this was a complaint. I think I addressed on Twitter, this idea that parents aren't good teachers. Well, the first time you do something, you're probably going to suck at it. Seems like a uh, a normal expectation. First time you decided to pick up a ball, you probably don't remember it, but you were probably not good at it. The first time that you tried to do anything, if you tried to play guitar the first time, you could probably play one note, you know, you're not good when you start doing something. Well, neither are first year teachers. And I don't think a lot of parents just pull their kids out of public school because they find out that their teacher is only 24 or something. What? We have a first year teacher teaching my kid? Unacceptable. They don't know how to teach because they've never done it before. The only thing that's different between you as the parent and the teacher is that the teacher has done more teaching. The idea that there are uh, educational experts and that their special education tools will en enhance their teaching ability is just not true. It's really all experience and most master teachers will tell you it's all about experience. You learn how to teach by teaching. You got to get in the classroom and do it to figure out how to do it. So your teacher prep programs, they're really about um, they're really about talking dogma. They are really about uh, imparting dogma to students. It's mandated by the state. So like I had to take a diversity and equity class. This was a class about how white people bad and how even black teachers are racist against black students. That was an actual conclusion in uh, in the book and in the class. And we had to write essays about this, about racism and stuff. So it's just dogma. The other one, was, big one was technology. You had to take a whole class on educational technology. Well, if educational technology was so important, you'd think it would have had an effect on outcomes when in fact it has had a net negative in general. They've actually done studies on this. Turns out kids with laptops don't have any higher academic achievement than kids using pen and paper. 
And in fact, they have found that teachers don't like the laptops because they disrupt the learning experience. They stop, you know, they distract kids. They are end up being a net negative. They inhibit the classroom environment and they don't yield any extra positives. So this has been studied many times, um, you know. So the point I'm trying to make here is that technology is a dogma. Diversity and equity is a dogma. This is what we had to take classes on. And none of that stuff really ends up helping you in the classroom. And even things that focus on teaching techniques, it's it's like reading a book about how to throw a baseball. How are you going to learn to throw a baseball? Oh, wait, let me see. Okay, you put your left foot forward. Okay, you want, okay. My arm needs to be behind my shoulder and I need to pull with my pectoral, pectoralis major and I can throw the ball, and throw the ball like this. You got to pick up a baseball and throw it to learn how to throw a baseball and you got to get in the classroom and teach to learn how to teach. Same thing with writing, by the way, guys. People ask, how can I improve as a writer? Just do it. Sit down and write every day and within one year, which is really not that long to practice a skill, you will have gained in ways that you can't even fathom. At the end of that one year, if you're writing even just a couple hundred words a day, you will grow so tremendously in your skills. You can't even believe it. So it's the same thing with teaching. Just give yourself a little while. Just know that you are probably going to be suboptimal at it. I'm suboptimal at it because it's very different from teaching in the classroom. But your kid's going to benefit as you get better and better at it. Not only that, but um, your kid is still going to be ahead even if you're not good at it because of all the other advantages. The efficiency bonuses, plus your kid is one-on-one. So it's one maybe subpar teacher with one kid that can exactly figure out what he needs and try a million different things and cares about his outcomes versus one possibly bad teacher. We don't even, you don't even know before your kid gets in the classroom and 35 kids that they have to deal with and try to meet all their needs for. So the one-on-one, you're going to gain a lot more from the one-on-one. If you're seeing the light go brighter and darker, it's because it's cloudy and then bright and I have a window right here. So uh, anyway, that's homeschooling. Yes. And you can do it. You have the skills to do it. You have the ability to do it. What most parents have a hard time thinking about is, uh, okay, well, when both my kids are in school, that frees up both parents to work. That's a lifestyle adjustment. You may have to get rid of a car. You may have to rethink how you do your lifestyle, but it turns out that kind of due to involution, Working that extra job doesn't really yield you any extra leisure time or extra stuff. And as you maybe shrink your lifestyle down or focus more on maybe a a slightly simpler lifestyle, you'll find that you don't really, you didn't really need that extra job. It was getting eaten up in things like daycare, gas, eating out, things like that. So just a a smart budget adjustment and a commitment to doing it uh, will probably end up within a short adjustment period yielding all those dividends, a better time with your kids, more time with your kids. You, you miss, you know, you can miss them growing up, right? They, they're only kids once. You get more of that precious time with your kids. You get more time maintaining your house, cooking home meal, home, you know, homemade meals, let's say, uh, and less time eating out, and uh, your kids get a better education. So in general, you can make this commitment. Yes, the the big one I think that people have a hard time wrapping their mind around is having a one one income household, but it's possible to do. I think mostly we've been trained to just exclude it, to think that it's impossible to have a one income household. Yeah, you may have to do lifestyle adjustments, which is better to do when your kids are young or before you have kids to think about this ahead of time, like me and my wife did, than it is to build up your lifestyle and buy a bunch of stuff and have new cars. We drive old cars. Our cars are old. Uh, They're over 10 years old at this point. Uh, but they still run and I'm going to maintain them and use them as long as I can use them so that I don't have to buy a new car. Um, we made those decisions about our lifestyle level before we got married and had kids. And so there's really not, we don't really have to think that much about it. Like right now, my wife is working a little bit further away from home because there's a lot more money involved. And the idea was that was going to be temporary because we're giving up time. It takes time to commute. And so you're getting paid for that extra time, but you don't want to do that forever. It's like once we achieve certain financial goals, hopefully we'll be able to let go the higher income job and go step down to a lower income job that's closer to home. Um, We we think about these things too, but everybody's so focused on trying to make the most money, they don't really think about all the trade-offs. So I'd encourage you guys to think about the trade-offs. And yes, you can do it. You can homeschool your kids and you can give them benefit. If you don't have kids yet, start thinking about this and talk with your partner about it and talk about it if you're going to date a man or a woman. 
and think about how you're going to raise your kids, have that be part of the conversation. And you'll find it's actually very easy to convince people who are either are very, very committed to public school experience that they can do that. The last one I'll mention is probably sports. This is, I was talking to someone, I think I was talking to Dean on, on Twitter, Dean Bradley. I don't think he watches the streams, but he's another author and he's in Texas and I'm from Texas originally. And so I know this football's big sports are big. There's their big cultural deal and the high school, especially in smaller towns. And there's lots of little towns in Texas. I'm from one from Lufkin. Um, the football team is a big deal. And so being on the football team and everyone focusing on that is a is a big enough deal that people will probably want to send their kids to public school just to have access to sports. But there's other sports you can do that are outside of school. Because of the way that society has been arranged, our team sports tend to get organized through the school. So you're making a big trade-off in that your kid's getting a suboptimal education and having to sit in a little box and be trained to be a good employee so he could play a team sport. If the kid is not going to be playing football, that's actually not an option for my son because he has hemophilia. It's just too dangerous a sport for that. But he could do other things which are way more fun, I think. Like, you know, he could take fencing or something, right? So there's a lot of other sports that he could do that are more individual um, and even team sports. There's Because soccer traditionally hadn't been done through schools, you can do AYSO or club soccer. There's lots of sports that you can get your kids involved in that aren't attached to school. So you just have to think a little bit outside the box for that. Or, you know, if you're really industrious, you could start up a homeschool football league or something, or just start up an intramural football league that is not attached to any school. You can always do that. Anyway, let's take a look at the chat, and then we'll have a little bit of fun today. I think I finished my soda. I brought a second one because this one was from this morning. Can't stream without the Coke Zero, you know what I'm saying, guys? 